Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Take your Bible, if you will, and look with me to the book of Exodus, the 20th chapter, if you will, and we'll uh, pick it up right where we left off a couple of weeks ago. Thank you for your prayers and your indulgence. Um, I sure did enjoy uh, the music and the preaching last Sunday. It was really good, uh, but uh, God had other plans. I, I was kind of flattened out for about eight or nine days, but uh, God's raised us up and I'm glad uh, to be back with you today. I want to talk to you this morning about taking no shortcuts, taking no shortcuts. Jews, Muslims, and Christians alike uh, will acknowledge the fact that God gave us 10 commandments by which to live by. Uh, when I read this text, there are two things that jump out at me. There's first of all the admonition of the Lord, and then there is the adoration of the Lord. Pick it up with me, Exodus 20, verse 4. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God. Uh, let's bow together for a moment of prayer. Father, thank you so much for the Lord Jesus. Thank you that uh, he made it possible for us to experience a great getting up morning. Uh, Lord, I'm grateful that we don't have to fear that day. But God, you've made our passage sure and safe. I pray you'd take your word now and that you would expose us to who we really are in the light of who you are. God, if there's some things in our life that we cherish more than you, would you show that to us? If there's some things in our life that we hold in higher regard, higher esteem, and greater importance than we do you in our life, make it clear and plain and unmistakable to us. And then would you give us the strength, and the power of your Holy Spirit to turn away from that so that you could have your rightful place among us. I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Now, what is an idol? An idol is anything that you place more value in and on than you do God. It is something that is occupying a place in your heart and in your life that only God has a right to occupy. Um, sometimes we park it in our driveway Sometimes we dock it at the shore. Oftentimes we hang it on the wall and plug it in and turn it on. The Bible gives us basically three uh, idols that uh, are acknowledged. There is uh, the God of Baal, who is also the God of sex. There's the God of Mammon, who is also identified as the God of money. And then there's a god, Molech, who is the god of violence. Now, in those days, idols were fashioned out of wood or metal or stone or some fashionable product. Today, we don't uh, have that in our homes. We don't fashion our idols uh, out of metal, but we have mental images that have become our idols. We now, we don't have Baal and we don't have Molech and uh, we don't have those kinds of gods. But what we do is that we pay billions of dollars to go down to the movie theater to worship the God of money and the God of violence and the God of sex. Or actually we even have it plugged in in the electricity of our homes and we sit before it and we watch it on television. What's going on in America today is America is telling our kids what's important. It's trying to tell our kids um, what they ought to value. It is very important that parents overcome the culture's attempts 
to shape and to form our kids' minds and to tell them that idols are not of God. It's very difficult, but you have to teach children the disadvantages of idols. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 4, when the Lord spake to you from the fire on Mount Sinai, you didn't see any form for your own good then. Make certain that you do not sin by making for yourselves an idol in any form at all. Now, the Bible tells us very plainly there that it is for our good that we don't worship idols. Now, let me just tell you why. There, there are about three things that I'll lay out for you. Uh, idols will let you down. Uh, idols will never live up to what they project. Idols will never deliver what they promise. The Bible says in Jeremiah 10, 14, those who make idols are disillusioned because the gods they made are false and lifeless. Uh, the Hebrew there literally says that these idols that we form and that we fashion don't breathe. They are breathless. We watch these ads that they come up on television. You've seen them. I've seen them. We've all seen them. That uh, if you will uh, wear this particular label in your clothes, you will become the most popular person around. If you will drink this beer right here, you're going to discover uh, that it doesn't get any better than that. If you will just brush your teeth with this toothpaste, uh, you will have more sex appeal than anybody else around you. They promise more than they can deliver. How many of you, and including me, uh, how many of you have ordered something through catalogs or off of Amazon and man, you just couldn't wait to get it? I mean, it's the very thing that you thought that you had to have and if you didn't have it, you wasn't going to be near as happy as you would be if you did have it and you mashed pay and you couldn't wait until it was delivered. And when that package finally did arrive, you zipped it open as fast as you could only to discover that it didn't make you nearly as happy as you thought it was going to. It, it, it really didn't have what it said that it was going to have or do what it said it was going to do. Anytime that you put your faith in a person, a place, or a thing, or a product, if you will, in the place of where God ought to be in your life. Anytime that you expect someone else to solve all of the problems that you have in your life other than God or guarantees you some kind of happiness, you're going to be disappointed. Why is that? Because idols will always let you down. The second thing I want to tell you about idols is idols will always bind you up. They will let you down. They will bind you. What do you mean by bind you up. Well, they will control you. 1 Corinthians 12 says, you know that while you were still heathen, you were led astray in many ways to worship the idols of lifeless things. Lifeless idols. Now, what's going to happen when you start worshiping something, idolizing something, more than you do God, you can expect a couple of things to happen. Number one, they will control you. Now, we have a term that is thrown around quite loosely in our culture today called addiction. Uh, and, and, and that's control, if you will. Many are addicted to work. Many are addicted to sex. Uh, many are addicted to drugs or to uh, alcohol or to sports, but that addiction comes, grabs hold of you, binds you up so to control your life. It ruins and runs your life. And you say, well, you know what? I, I, I can give it up any time that I want to. Well, if that's true, why don't you? If you have the power to give it up, then why don't you? I'll tell you why. It's because you don't control it. It controls you. It binds you up. You don't bind it up. It controls your life. Second, it leads you astray. Not only does it control you, it leads you astray. It leads you from the place where God ought to be in your life 
and it sets up in your life instead. Uh, I'll give you a great example of that if I could. How many of us have at some point in time uh, saw the brass ring out there and we went after that brass ring. We wanted that promotion. Uh, we wanted that advancement and we wanted it so desperately that it took us away from the time that our children ought to have rightfully had in our life. Uh, how many people uh, wanted the profits that they saw out there, but in order to get the profits, uh, they had to give up some of the convictions that they had held on so strongly to for most of their life. But in order to get it, they had to let it go and, and wound up getting bound up and controlled by that. H how many people, uh, well, I can relate to this one because I lived it for so many years. H how many of us worked for the approval of someone else controlled by their approval and being controlled by their approval and desiring for that acceptance so much that they literally were choosing what was right for you. I got a word for you. We call it codependency, but the word of God goes way beyond codependency and says that it is idolatry because that's the place God is supposed to occupy uh, in your life. You understand, in order to break through from that, uh, you've got to get rid of that and allow God the rightful place, first place uh, in your life. Idols uh, will let you down. Idols will bind you up. And idols will lure you in. Um, you'll become, I understand, you will become what you value the most. You will become what is first in your life. Psalm 115 verse 8 says, those who make idols become like them and so will those who trust in them. Here, here's what happens. We start shaping the idols, but before it's over with, the idols in turn have shaped uh, us. Whatever is first in your life, whatever is preeminent in your life, uh, whatever it has first place in your life, that is what you are going to become. God has the right to be first in your life. After all, he's the one that made you. One of my favorite Bible stories is about the rich young ruler. He comes to Christ and he says, I want to follow you. I, I want to be your disciple." Uh, and and the, the Lord just went directly to the point. He says to this rich young ruler, he says, okay, go sell everything that you have and give it to the poor and then come and follow me. You won't find Jesus saying that to anyone else in all of the Bible. It's the only time that he ever addressed this issue with anybody. Do you know why he did it? Because he went to the very root of the guy's problem. He went to what was the most important to that young man. And he says, young man, you have a God in your life. And you can't have a God in your life. That is the place where I am to occupy. And so get rid of your God and then you can come and follow me. And the Bible says that he went away extremely sorrowful because he had great wealth. He wasn't willing to let go of the very thing that occupied the place of God in his life. May I ask you this morning, what is it that you need to let go of? How many of you are involved in a relationship that you know uh, is so much stronger than your relationship to God? And God says, if we're going to be right with each other, you've got to let go of that. You've got to let, I'm not ready to let go of that relationship. How many of you are involved in a career? Your career means more to you than anything else in life itself. That's the place where God is supposed to occupy. You say, I'm not willing to let go of that. Uh, I, I'm not willing to trust God in that area of my life. Uh, God says, then you can't be my disciple. H have you ever thought about this? It's kind of a crude analogy, but it still works. Uh, how, many, how many of you have ever thought about uh, how big a hundred dollar bill is in church and how small it is at Dick's Sporting Goods. <laughs> you ever thought about that? 
heard about a this little boy he's riding home from church with his daddy. They had been to this church the very first time. And the daddy was just complaining about everything. He said, you know, that preacher was so long and the music was way too loud and the building was so hot. And the little boy said, well, dad, I, I didn't think it was a bad show for a dollar. <laughs> so the admonition is, is that you cannot have an idol. You cannot have something in the place where God is supposed to occupy in your life. Now, let's move on to the admonition or the adoration, if I could. You say, how does that apply to the families? Well, how many of you have heard or maybe you've made this statement somewhere along the way? Uh, you know, I just worship the ground they walk on. You, you, ever, you ever heard a wife say that about her husband or a husband say that about their wife or maybe a son or daughter say that about one of their parents? I just worship the ground they walk on. God says, no. I'm the only one. You can have no other person, no other thing before me. The Bible says many exchange the truth about God for a lie. They worship and serve what God has created instead of the creator himself. I'm watching some folks right now, mainly on social media, but I know them really well, and I am watching them do that very thing. How many of you know some very sharp, intelligent people that uh, really worship? Matter of fact, we got a whole bunch of people today. Uh, they're worshiping the beach, and they're worshiping the mountains instead of being in church. But, but it's amazing to me how many rational, intelligent human beings do stupid things that involve astrology and crystals and stars and they're looking at all of that stuff for guidance and power. I've done a little work here. I know why they do it. And I think it'll make more sense to you when you think, I just don't understand how those people, they're very, they're very smart, they're very intelligent, they're very educated. How could they do that? Well, let me just give you two or three reasons why. First of all, they want to localize God. They feel like if I can just put God in a box, they feel like if I can just put God in a rock, if I can just put him in a crystal, if I can localize him, if I can isolate him into a building, if you will. A lot of people think, you know, I can't worship anywhere. I got to go be there at that building. They feel like if I can just put God in that box, if I can localize, then I don't have to worry about him going everywhere I go, hearing everything that I say, and seeing everything that I do because he's over there. And as long as he's over there, he's not with me. And so he's not aware. I've localized him. Second, they lessen God. They lessen God. Here's what the word says. The word says, let us make man in our image. Can you, can you track with me? Are you with me? Let us, is that not what the word says? Let us make man. Here's what's happening in American culture in, in, in spiritual circles right now. We have taken that passage of scripture and we have changed it to saying, let us make God in our image. Uh, let, let's, let's make God be who we want God to be. And you hear terms and terminologies like this. My idea of God is, and then they fill in the blank. You hear terms like higher power. And you're saying, well, whatever your higher power is. If your higher power is a frog, then so be it. If your higher power is a waterfall, so be it. If your higher power is this or that. And so they have lessened God to their own image and to their own liking and shaping God to accommodate their own standards. Um, let, let me ask you, my idea of God... Who in the world gave man the authority to determine the characteristics of God? We don't have that authority. 
Many theologians, and I use that term, they, they, they will use those terms to justify their own lifestyle. Now, well, you know what, I, I know that my lifestyle is not what it ought to be. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm involved with this woman over here. I'm involved with this man over there, and I know it's wrong. And I, but, but, you know, God doesn't care about those little things. God cares more about da, 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 da. He cares more about the climate than he does about this. Right? And so they have reduced God, and they have lessened him. I heard about a little girl at school. Teacher came by her desk one day and the little girl was just doodling and doodling and the teacher said, uh, honey, what are you doing? She said, I'm drawing a picture of the face of God. And the teacher said, well, honey, don't you know, nobody knows what God looks like. She said, well, they will when I get done. <laughs> now that may be for a little child, but adults are doing the same thing. We're trying to create an image of God that we perceive rather than who he really is. So they localize God, they lessen God, and then they limit God. They want to control him. You got to understand that the creature can never be greater than the creator. And so if we're fashioning an idol and creating an idol in our life, then we are worshiping what we have created, which makes us in control of what we are worshiping. It puts us in a superior position. So you, you, it, it's kind of like that little boy uh, who went to his mama and he said, Mama, my birthday's coming up and uh, I, I really want a new bicycle for my birthday. And she said, well, son, uh, just go pray and ask God to give you a bicycle. So he goes into his bedroom, puts up a piece of paper and a pencil, and he starts writing a letter to God and says, Dear God, I've been a good boy all year long, and I, I, I want you to give me a bicycle. And he read it, and he thought, you know, that's not true. And so he wadded it up and threw it in the trash can, and he wrote another letter. He says, Dear God, uh, I've been a good boy most of the year this year. And he thought, that's not real true either. So he wadded it up and threw it into the trash can. And he came back and he started all over. Dear God, I want to be a good boy this year. I need a bicycle. And he looked at it and he said, you know what? That's not true either. So he goes in and he wads it up, throws it into the trash can. And he goes into the living room and he gets a statue of Mary. And he wraps it up in a towel, throws it up into the bed. He goes back and he begins to write, dear God, if you ever want to see your mother again, But isn't that just like what we're hearing and watching and seeing is that people want to control God. I've even seen televangelists and, and lots of folks begin to make demands on God. I demand you, I command you in the name of Jesus and we want to control God. And so we resort to idol worship in order to do it and to limit him. Now let me, let me give you, there are three reasons today why I believe that you all love God first. First of all, it pleases us. It pleases us. It, when, when you get to the point in your life that you realize that there are certain things in your life that you hold in higher regard, higher esteem, love and devote more time to than God himself, and, and you, you, you realize, I can't do that. I've got to worship God. I can't worship this stuff. I've got to worship God. All of a sudden, you discover that everything that you've been looking for in your life to bring about joy, peace, contentment, and fulfillment, you have discovered and found and realized in Jesus. It's more fulfilling. It's pleasing to you. Um, I, I've never heard in all my ministry anybody ever come to the end of their life or even in the middle of their life as far as that's concerned that ever said, um, I, I regret ever giving my life to Jesus. I've never heard that said. You know what I have heard? I regret I didn't do it a lot sooner than I did. Why? Because Jesus is the very thing that brings about what you've been looking for the most. Uh, number two, it releases me. Not only does it please me, it releases me. You say, what do you mean that it releases me? 
Well, the Bible says you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The Bible says whom the Son sets free is free uh, indeed. Powerful words. Unbelievable words. What do you mean free? Well, it frees me up from the guilt, the regret, and the sin of my past. Uh, it doesn't haunt me anymore because I know that when God is preeminent in my life, when he's the Lord of my life, when he is in first place in my life, every ugly sin that I've ever committed has already been covered in the blood and I don't have to worry about my past anymore. It frees me up in the present because I know with the presence of God in my heart, the power of the Holy Spirit in me, every addiction, every bondage, every sin that has bound me up, God has brought about the freedom and the power to be able to break that bondage. It, it, it really releases me and frees me up for the future. No longer do I have to worry about dying no longer do I have to worry about death. No longer do I have to worry about my destination. I am freed up because I know that that's been secure through the blood of Jesus Christ. So it pleases me, it releases me, and it increases me. I now can become everything that God ever intended for me to be. That's just such a beautiful thing. It's such a powerful thing. Because the fact of the matter is, you will become what you love. If you want to become more like Jesus, just love Jesus. You will become who is first in your heart and in your life. How many of you are here today that the Holy Spirit of God has already revealed some things in your heart and your life that you know that ought not to be there. Maybe you're watching through live stream and, and God's revealed to you that he's not first place in your heart and in your life. Well, then today is the day that you acknowledge that. Today is the day that God resumes his rightful place in you. Would you stand with me and let's pray together for just a minute? Every head bowed and Every eye closed for just a second or two. Father, I want to just say thank you for who you are. I want to thank you for the blessings of this day. I want to thank you for the 29 who 70 years ago this month began this work led by your Holy Spirit with the sole intentions of seeing people come to faith in you. With the sole intention of seeing you change lives and make a difference here in this community. God, the fruit of their labor is still going on when dozens and dozens of people here in that earlier service acknowledged that there were some things in their life that were not right. They were out of order or shouldn't have been there to start with. Minimally, you were not first in their life. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.